Oh, 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 should be good to go. Ah, no one drew on that. Oh, let me make sure. Uh, uh, let me make sure everything's all good. Are we good to go? Good to go. Uh, whew. I'm only seven minutes late. Oh yeah, this door. That's what I got. Okay. So how come it just says no signal now? Ah. What's going on here? Should have signal. Wait, maybe it's just the delay. I gotta get people to come hang out. Oh, there I am. <laughs> Jeez, I guess it was working. You guys get to see my uh, my uh, sharing on Facebook face. Okay. Woohoo! Okay, sorry. Yeah. Hey, Mary. Okay, now I'm only 10 minutes late. Good to go. I just uh, just shared it up on my Facebook page. Let me uh, get this out there. Give me a second. Oh, wait. Right here. Let's go, Dan. Oh, wait, this is plant session number three. I better change that number. Twa. There we go. Ah, okay. Well, Mary, how's Mary? Hopefully, Mary's all good. Joe's all good. A little flustered. It was uh, it was dark for a while on my uh, on on my uh, I made a silly mistake, but we're good to go now. I got all kinds here that I wanted to show you guys. Ah. Where should I begin? Maybe right here. If I go here, whoa. No, <laughs> uh, maybe then this one. 
Yeah. This one? Yeah. Right there. Watch this. Come on! Yes! <laughs> Ever cute. <laughs> uh, you know what? I could just go like this. Add. Uh, okay. Add. Nope. This one. How come I can't add that one? The heck? It's right here now. Maybe I could. Okay, sorry. One second. There. Except, uh, make me small. <laughs> uh, okay, I hope this can work. I tried so hard to do everything. Uh... <laughs> I'm all good. You're all good. We're all good. Everything's good. Everything's good. Okay. So yeah, I guess uh, some of the things that I wanted to talk about today is pretty well uh, just the same, uh, so not not the same. Sorry, sorry. A continuation of uh, what we were, what we started last week. Except I'm trying to become more savvy, as savvy as I can. Hopefully by the fall I'll be just flying through this like as if I've been doing it my whole life. Uh, so here we go is uh i wanted to be able to uh look at there are small picture they're cute where's all the big the big ones there we go there's a little bit better looking one now if i make sure oh my mommy is calling me like i cannot answer it yet though uh let's see here I was going to just check. Now I'm just going to check here. So there, that that works. That looks good. Okay, now I'm just going to hope and pray that everything is good. Okay, so um, this is uh, one thing that I that I uh, have been just completely obsessed with, probably even since last Friday when we got to hang out and when we were doing this, is, uh, is uh, the names of plants the names of medicine and how important uh, how important it is to know all the names of like the Nishaba names the the scientific names or the Latin names and then all of the different common names and I know exactly why they are called that and so I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit more like especially for uh, the students who are uh, well, who who are doing this for like staff and faculty at Fleming, uh, to be able to become more familiar from the Shlava perspective, the as to what is uh, what's all happening on campus and with all of the different uh, all of the different plants there, all the different medicines there. So uh, I thought we could start with uh, one that's extremely common, one that's very simple for us to sort of uh, wrap our heads around is. Um, is going to be oh my god this uh, golden rods all the different golden rods there's uh, uh, I don't know how many different golden rods we have like eight eight different golden rods and in uh, the Shaba language we will call golden rods it's all abguni well it's all abguni like um, is the normal oh I don't need these it's all abguni is the normal size uh, um, goldenrod. There's three different sizes. This is, uh, and so what I want to show you here is um, sort of how that looks, three different sizes. So here uh, you have more of, uh, so the smallest size goldenrod is going to be, um, they will generally have these flowers that look like a club and uh, they're very short, they're very small, and they exist in that same, same level as grasses would. And then uh, a size up would be, uh, uh, would be the, the flat top sort of um, umbrella-like goldenrods, just like you can see right here. And then uh, this one as well, like grass leaf goldenrod is going to have that flat top 
Uh, and um, flat top aster, which has white flowers. I should have got a picture of that. It's pretty cool. It's we just identified recently. We being the field, sorry, I have nothing to do with this. But we being the field, identified flat top aster as now being a sold out of a, a goldenrod. And so uh, those ones that have the flat top and uh, are are a little bit taller. They're like a normal size goldenrod. Uh, and then there's the uh, the big ones, the ones that have these great big uh, flowers that sort of uh, are like a big triangle and some of them at the tip of the triangle sort of fall over or they sort of have like this elm like branching uh, pattern of the flowers. I wonder if I got a picture of one of those. No, I didn't. Right, so right here is the best you got. But what happens is they grow the, the really tall ones, the soldago, like canadensis, the, the big massive one is going to have the same branching pattern as elm. So there's three different flower types and three different sizes. And uh, there's some overlap between, between them. Of course, there's hybridization and there's all these different things. But generally, the small ones are going to have a club-like flower. And then the medium-sized ones are going to have a flat top. And then the big ones are going to have like that elm sort of big uh, triangle uh, falling over sort of uh, branching pattern and so the way that we call all of these in the Shnabe language and the Shnabe when is we will call the small golden rods will be uh, they will be small we'll add that diminutive suffix at the end to make sure that we understand that we're talking about the small one and so uh, those would be the ones with the club flower and then the flat top ones the normal size ones would be the just normal <laughs> uh, and then is a big one are the ones that are like the size of shrubs uh, and um, mainly uh, I guess medicinally we will use the small ones we'll use the we'll use uh, the club shaped golden rods for medicine and uh, like as far as uh, medicine goes, I guess I do not really understand like a very, very significant medicinal use of goldenrods uh, that is specific. Other than like, uh, you know, it'll ha it has a very important ecological purpose and ecological use as being like a, uh, one of those plants that come that, that happen later into the fall. Uh, and provide that really big blast of food for all of the pollinators uh, very late in the year. So goldenrods and asters are like this big, whew, it's also the reason why, you know like some people will get real bad springtime allergies from like birches and things like that, 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 pollen, that uh, release their pollen very early in the year. And then there's the people who get the allergies like in the midsummer, uh, which is generally to like ragweed. Um, are, are most most mostly attributed to ragweed but if you, some people don't get spring allergies some people don't get summer allergies we'll get allergies in the fall where you get real bad seasonal allergies in the fall and the main culprit for that is uh, goldenrods uh, they, when you get that late summer and, uh, and early fall time allergies it's going to be mainly because of goldenrods and how how bad the pollen can be from there and so um, you know how everybody will say, uh, I mean, which is very true, I don't want to sort of diminish that idea, but we'll say if you have allergies, you will just, you, you should just have, um, uh, you should just have honey. Honey will help with your allergies. <laughs> and, uh, which is true to like a very small degree, uh, but and then local honey and unpasteurized honey, and then it gets you know a little bit more specific, uh, because then uh, the pasteurization process is not going to destroy any of the proteins that are there from all of the plants. So the idea of uh, of um, using honey is microdosing with your allergen, microdosing with the plant that you are allergic to, having small little bits that aren't going to cause like this mast cell or this uh, uh, really strong histemic response. You you're going to just have small doses that will give your body the ability to understand exactly what's happening and not overreact and just say, okay, you know, maybe we don't have to freak out like this. It's okay. And then overcome your allergy. So microdosing, it's actually like the most successful way to, uh, uh, to overcome an allergy is by microdosing. You could do it in, uh, with, your, with your physicians in, in Ontario for a long time now. Uh, it's just not practiced a lot. This is a lot easier just to start pumping reactant and you know once you develop a, uh, uh, um, 
uh, once you uh, develop a tolerance for all of these different uh, antihistamines, uh, then you could look into microdosing. <laughs> but you could just start microdosing now with all of these plants that you are allergic to. And so, you, yeah, it's it's kind of funny the way everything works. Uh, every other country in the world is uh, is their first, first not every other country. Sorry. Now Lizzo's calling me. Holy, hey, what's happening here? My phone's going crazy. As soon as I start working, I only work one hour today. Liz, just kidding. <laughs> Half kidding. Uh, I should start answering these. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so microdosing is uh, a lot of countries are looking to this as being the first option because you're just going to develop a tolerance to antihistamines and then, you know, when you when you actually uh, can, can use them, uh, you're, you're going to be tolerant to them and they're not going to be effective so let's try microdosing first and so you could uh, uh, microdose your way through uh, anaphylactic peanut allergies as well which a lot of countries have uh, uh, an incredibly uh, uh, large amount of success with um, anyway uh, I don't know where I was going with that one but uh, mm. Oh yeah, so like when people tell you, <laughs> this is kind of funny, when people tell you, you could just ha have honey and you'll get over your allergies. I get people buying like, uh, uh, like honey bee, I mean like a uh, squeeze bottle honey uh, that's totally pasteurized and that's half corn syrup or, or even 90% corn syrup with like a little bit of honey added so then they could get around all of these regulations and, and to, to be able to call it honey it's actually just corn syrup <laughs> like big box stores often selling this garbage right and so people will buy that and they'll be like I tried micro I tried that I tried that for years buying honey and then you see what kind of honey they buy oh well this is why it's because it's not even actual honey so then you buy real honey 100% real honey uh, but then it's been pasteurized, right? So all of the, the pasteurization process, which is heat, it uh, breaks down the protein inside that, uh, the protein from the plants, from the pollen from the plants that is responsible for that, uh, you know, the con small consumptions or consumption of small little bits of all of these different plants of the allergen to overcome the allergy. You're, um, you're, not, you're, <laughs> you're not getting it because it's all burnt in the pasteurization process. And so that's not even enough. Everybody's always like, well, I tried that for years. I got 100% real honey. But then it's like, ah, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry, but it was pasteurized. You have to try again. Uh, and, and then, uh, and so you have to be getting like 100% real honey that is unpasteurized, completely raw. And, and, uh, uh, and, then, and then even then sometimes it's not effective and people get mad. They're like, I tried that. But then it's because it's filtered. And you can't get filtered either because uh, the, the, sometimes the filtration process is so incredibly fine. Uh, historically, the filtration process was just supposed to be some like real rough cheesecloth kind of thing to be able to get like the, 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 the bee parts, like a couple wings and legs and you know bee eyeballs that end up in your honey to be able to just filter that out. But the filtration process that some companies will apply to their honey is so fine that it's, it's extracting, extracting the pollen, pollen from the from, from the honey. So then you're still not getting what you need to be able to accomplish that, that to have that micro dosing sort of effect. And, and so that kind of sucks because then you, again you have to say no. Okay, so you have to be getting 100% uh, real honey that ha that is raw and that is unfiltered or like coarsely filtered. Uh, and and uh, sometimes, sometimes even just, just run the risk of having a couple bee parts on your on your toast in the morning, like a, a wing here, a leg there, and and just consider that okay, <laughs> because uh, and, and so just to go right to the farmer and just get like just get it right, just squeeze it right out of the cone kind of thing. Because uh, that's, that's where it's at. That's, that's where you're gonna get those small little bits of pollen uh, that that might that will have that microdosing effect that will give you the ability to overcome your seasonal allergies. Uh, but then it's like you could get even more specific with this because if you have only springtime allergies 
from uh, uh, from like birches and birches, the number one culprit for uh, springtime allergies. And so then for this situation, you 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 can't even use honey at all. It's not going to help. And what you have so what you have to do is actually just go and consume the the pollen from the catkins of birch and. Uh, which used to be a common food anyway. It's actually pretty good just to, uh, just to nibble on a couple of those. They're like, um, it's almost like a, almost like a nut, I guess. Uh, if you, it's like a, it's like a really planty nut. <laughs> but it's kind of nice just to eat a little bit, and then uh, uh, that that will be your microdosing sort of ability. You know, with with birch, uh, birch is actually the the the. the uh, what beekeepers used to, I don't know, like this is coming from like real old school beekeepers, but what beekeepers used to do is uh, uh, birch was the main source of uh, pollen to be able to get winter, uh, to be able to like, I don't know, feed bees, I guess. I don't know what they would do, what they describe. I'm not a beekeeper, obviously, I don't know, really, uh, I'm, I'm out of my league here, but uh, I had one real nice little, uh, a uh, woman be able to tell me that uh, uh, um, uh, that she used to put big blankets when she was a kid, like a long time ago. She used to put big white sheets underneath the uh, birch trees, and all that pollen would fall. And uh, every day, every morning, there would be pollen. And so you would just lift up the sheets and uh, in the corners, and then all that pollen would just sort of fall into the center, and then you just funnel that into a bag. And in the course of a week of under one tree, like you'd put like 10 sheets under a tree, right? Because the tree covers a lot of area. Uh, so you have like 10 sheets there and uh, you'd be getting 50 pound bags every week of doing that for every tree that you're under uh, of pollen. And so like that's like a 50 pound bag of flour that you'd be getting from one tree. So it was pretty actually incredible way to be able to uh, have a flower and then and so they would use that to like I don't know feed the bees I guess I don't understand how this works but they would collect a whole bunch of it for their bees uh, but they would also like dig into the big bags when they would be making soup or something pour a whole bunch in there to help thicken it up and so they in order to add it to bread and they would use it to as as like this uh, not a, not a, a main source of flour but as a flour enhancer or a flour uh, substitute um, and certainly like you could it's, uh, it's referred to sometimes as like a, uh, a flower um, a survival flower uh, which whatever I have issues with that term but anyway they uh, it's really easy to get that pollen and, and the way she described it she's from Hamilton she was raised in Hamilton before Hamilton was Hamilton <laughs> uh, and 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 um, it, it uh, it used to be like real common, everybody used to do it and, and everyone would have this big bag of pollen, big burlap sack of pollen in the, in the room, uh, uh, in a room and that's what it was for, it was for bees, it was for eating and it's just like everybody had it, you know, it's like everybody uh, uh, has a bag of Robin Hood, we used to have big bags of pollen, so it used to be a part of our diet, now it's not. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that creates this, this, uh, this little epidemic of allergies that everyone is having now is because this is the first time humans are living in, in closed, completely enclosed spaces where we have like old filtration systems in our houses that only let air in that has been filtered I don't know how many times. So it's, uh, it's a pretty unusual for humans to, to have to uh, deal with the situation and so uh, that separation that happens between something we are normally constantly exposed to now there's periods of separation uh, then uh, uh, then when we are introduced to pollen again it's unusual and our body is like hey what the heck is this I don't know what this is because of the spirit of separation now it's here and our body has a it has an unusually uh, uh, enlarged reaction to it simply just because it doesn't know what to do uh, it, that's a really uh, simplified version simplified way to understand allergies it gets, it gets pretty complex but the um, that's the way I like to understand that's pretty well what's happening you don't need to you don't need to get super complex uh, but the uh, and it's actually pretty amazing to sort of attribute our, our separation from the environment as being a catalyst to our allergy to the environment 
uh, and certainly in, uh, in these aspects where we're not eating it uh, or we're not constantly in the presence of it because our windows are closed and our AC is on, uh, etc. You know, so that's a pretty funny idea. But yeah, for honey and for honey as that microdosing solution to allergies, number one, it's fairly unsuccessful. <laughs> It takes a lot of dedication and a lot of work and, and of course, very specific products. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, yes, it does end up being quite unsuccessful. Uh, but if you do want it to be successful, you got to be as specific as you can. Getting honey from your air, immediate area where you are living and where you have allergies to. And then, uh, and, and, but then also you can become specific to, like for birch, if you have springtime allergies, uh, sort of encouraging and incorporating birch pollen into your diet and, and microdosing yourself there. Honey is not going to help with that. Uh, and then those midsummer allergies with. Uh, uh, that you know the number one sort of main culprit of this is an invasive species called uh, ragweed, and so so then that pollen that you would have in the in in uh, the for, and so the honey that you would have to overcome your summer allergies would be only honey that is harvested from bees that were doing their work in that time period. Uh, and then for the fall, most of us have goldenrod allergies. We have allergies to those three sorts of sets of uh, plants, right? And so uh, the... You're echoey. I listened to you and you're extremely echoey. It's fine. You just sound like... Uh -huh. I just think if you could fix it, it might oh. help everybody. I know what's happening here. I just Yay. thought I'd tell you. Yeah, right there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't watching your. Uh, my. Uh, yeah, I wasn't watching. I was. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. Uh, it should be fixed now. Dang. Yeah. I was just. I just accidentally did that setting up. Ah, one button. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Hopefully you're still able to follow everything I was saying. Um, yeah, so so anyway, um, yeah, you could even get more specific and get the honey that is only uh, harvested from bees that are doing work in the late summer and into the fall. If you're and so you have to get you the the so you can get as like super specific. It's actually pretty incredible. Uh, then this is this is going to increase the efficacy of uh, using honey as a, your microdosing sort of vehicle uh, to be able to overcome those uh, those allergies. Uh, then you'll be much more uh, uh, positioning yourself in a mu much more possible place to achieve success using this method. Uh, but yeah, um, one of the things that I wanted to say about goldenrod is 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 that uh, it sort of stole the name. Dandelions stole their, their name. No one even recognizes dandelions as... Uh, uh, or sorry, no one, sometimes people won't remember. Well, okay, so what happened? I'll just tell you what happened. Uh, visiting with my grandma, we were going on this big uh, dandelion crazy uh, uh, adventures, making coffee and stuff like that. And uh, my and my grandma would always call it, it's all abogoni. And so then when we brought her goldenrod and said, hey, how do you, what's this one called? And she looked at it and she said, it's all abogoni. <laughs> and we we're like, oh, what's happening here? And she was like, hey, I think I taught you something wrong. I think that this is a, a goldenrod. This is the true Zawabugoni because dandelions are not from here. They're an invasive species from Europe, right? So uh, it just came here and stole the name. A lot of people will call dandelions Zawabugoni. Uh, and then when, you, when shown goldenrod, won't remember how to say it. Because dandelions just jacked it. So I like giving that opportunity to be able to refer to some of these uh, medicines, some of these plants as, uh, as, um, as being uh, um, uh, uh, with their original name. And for dandelions, yeah, that, that really helps. Or for uh, goldenrods, that, that really helps. Uh Yeah, there you go, Mary. 
Lots of echo in my voice. Yeah. Jeez. Well, I figured out how figured out how to do it. I feel like I'm talking real slow. I figured out how to do it. <laughs> um let me uh let me grab another one here. What's another one that's really common at, at Fleming? Uh um uh, bah, 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 bah. Oh yeah, you know what I wanted to do with you guys? I wanted to do this one. This is one of my favorites. Absolutely beautiful. This is, uh, um, you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to go here. Because i got to keep an eye on you guys. i got to figure out how to way to keep an eye on you guys. Your audio is echoing. I know. How do I fix that? Okay, if I'm on my Facebook page and I follow that link I shared, I should be able to watch myself live. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm still figuring all this stuff out. How come I won't click? Maybe Lizzo was trying to call and tell me that it's echoing. <laughs> uh, now I can't see. Okay, if I go back here. So I can look at your comments. There we go. Now I could see her comments. Much better, she says. There we go. Okay, cool. I can see it now. Keep on top of those comments. Cool. I like that. Looks good. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah. This is one of my favorite flowers. Memnon quail. We'll call it. GM triflora. Triflora because it'll have three flowers per uh, stem. Uh, and so GM triflora. I keep almost saying trilobum, I mean tri trifolia. Uh, okay, so GM triflora, 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 is uh, prairie smoke. We'll call it prairie smoke because uh, what happens is uh, that flower will blossom. This 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 little bud, it, when it looks like a bud like this, it looks like a, it looks exactly like an avon. Like when an avon is fully bloomed, that's sort of the same look that it has. But this one is not an avon, and what happens, it just pops, and then it'll have that big, uh, a bunch of hair will come out. It look like a troll, <laughs> it look like a little troll doll. Uh, but the memnon, uh, so yeah, it's called prairie smoke because uh, it's a very social plant, uh, and. Uh, um, it uses these, it creates those tendrils that look like hair. At the end of that tendril, there's going to be a seed. And that seed is going to, uh, it makes that, that big long tendril to try to grab wind, to use wind to disperse uh, the seeds. But um, that usually ends up being pretty unsuccessful because it's not like, a, a, not like milkweed. Milkweed will have a tiny little flat seed. Uh, and then it'll create that big umbrella that really grabs the wind and it can go like hundreds of kilometers before it'll land. This one, not so much. It, it you know, makes that tendril, it'll grab a little gust of wind and land a couple feet away. <laughs> it's not a very successful method, but I think it accomplishes what this plant wants, which is to be a dominant in that like Meshkodeong, like in that prairie setting. Uh, and so like in an area that has recovered by fires or, or, or has been sort of, uh, uh, cleaned away, this plant really is, 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 uh, will dominate to just roll in and spread itself around, uh, because it just spreads in the same field. And so all of these seeds will just land somewhere within proximity, uh, to the parent plant. And so effectively I, I should have grabbed a really nice picture, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it'll end up just covering a whole field or a whole section of a field. And what it just looks like is like there's a whole bunch, like a, a layer of smoke on top of the field. And so we'll call it prairie smoke. It's actually a really cool name. Uh, but uh, this is one of the most beautiful flowers. Uh, 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 in order for it to blossom, in order for all those hairs to come out, uh, it has to get like mechanically ripped open, it's, which is usually by bees, or it can be uh, br brushed against by another creature or a bird or something like that. Uh, but it has to be like 
mechanically uh, ripped open in order for that to happen. Uh, so you'll get, and so it'll make like this real sweet little nectar inside this little, this little, uh, uh, um, something to entice other creatures to come and look in. And uh, when they do that, that's when they rip it open and uh, uh, then they all pop. Yeah. So it, it looks really, really nice. I really, really love this plant. But yeah, we will call it Memnaan Koya. And uh, one really easy way to understand uh, what this, what it's describing, what the name is describing, is uh, because of the way that this looks. <laughs> is like Memnaan um, Koya, like somebody who has real nice hair, like Elvis, real slick real ever slick hair uh just the way that it looks like on a troll doll real nice hair you can you can make it look nice or it can look really rough but when you make it real nice uh so is sort of describing the way that that real that looks like nice hair and uh i really like this one it's one of the, one of the most beautiful flowers uh, 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 one of the things though that I wanted to talk to you about is that um, the 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 that uh, this one of my favorite ideas that um, that you know we we've been um, we have so much fun with uh, that we have been having so much fun with for for years now ever, uh, is that every sound means something else in our language in the Shtabe language every sound means something else every sound does something else and when you have the sound uh inside of a word it it indicates that there's a change that's happening there uh and, and it usually indicates towards a permanent change that is happening there that that you can see that that is observable and so um uh so like uh like pkoene uh, is uh, smoke, and uh, so you hear that word or that sound kwe inside pkoene, and so of course the change that's happening there is uh, some sort of organic matter is uh, getting reduced into like uh, I think you would say ash is uh, pungwe uh, it, or, or something like that. I might be wrong, but that's what I remember anyway. But yeah, the change that's happening there, something is turning turning into to two things, smoke and ash. And so uh um there's also like uh kwe is uh, or ikwe is the word that we will use to describe women. Of course, the changes that women have to go through are pretty crazy. All the <coughs> all of the different changes that that has to happen in in in, in their life uh, namely in in the in the stage of uh, becoming uh, or childbearing is uh, or becoming pregnant the changes that happen to a woman's body then is actually pretty incredible we had a uh, one really amazing midwife who who is uh, you know responsible for facilitating like 1500 births or something like you know, this was like 10 years ago so it's probably way more by now she always told us that uh uh there are so many changes that happen with uh with the way that a woman looks with uh, so many different parts of her body when she becomes pregnant and because of all of the births and all of the uh engagement that she has had as a midwife with uh, uh, uh like pregnant women all over the place is uh she's become so in tune with being able to identify what those changes are that she could be walking through a shopping mall and i just just pick out everybody who is is pregnant or has been pregnant before and she said whether they even know it or not i will know because <laughs> that's how uh that's how dramatic the changes of a woman that happen uh, uh and of course at multiple different stages of their life they ha are exposed to this uh uh um, these changes and so you know it's kind of actually pretty incredible uh that the word that we have to describe women is uh is like just the epitome of change itself and so we will just say kwe quelk is women <laughs> so it's kind of kind of interesting the way that happens but one of the cool things that i want to tell you about is uh bread bread or making bread is probably like uh we will call it bread and so you hear that kwe word in there as well and uh 
it's hilarious <laughs> it's hilarious the way we will say because like bread is the is is another sort of epitome of change uh uh and and a true carrier of that sound because uh bread you know we treat it so bad like that plant you get wheat or something like this you know growing in the field and uh and then what we do is we chop it down and we let it dry out and then once it's <laughs> it's actually real funny oh man okay so you have wheat growing in the field it's a living plant that that you know uh will make seeds and those seeds are the potential for this plant to reproduce to, to grow again and so what we do is we chop it down and those seeds will dry out and uh and when they dry out they lose a lot of their viability and so uh they dry out and then we take it and then we smash it against the floor <laughs> to release the seeds right uh, i forget what that's called <laughs> Then all the seeds come off, uh, and then we harvest all of those seeds. All of that reproduction, reproductive potential that this plant works so hard for, we'll grab it all, and then, uh, and then we'll dry it out further until it's completely dry, till all the life is removed from this. What can happen though is that seed can be rehydrated and it can be planted. It can be sown and it's going to grow, but we can't let that happen. So what we do is we grind it all up into dust. <laughs> we turn it into flour and and then and so there's absolutely no potential that the seed is going to come back but we don't even stop there what we'll do is we'll tease it and we'll add water to that and that water is going to mix and make dough and uh and so we just tease it with the opportunity to live but it's all ground up so not gonna happen so yeah we mix water with it we make dough and then we put it in the oven and then under this uh, crazy amount of heat to bake it and so so then we yeah we we burn it it just put it in the oven and, and to make our bread and burn it so we pull it out of there out of the oven after it's just been burnt and turned into bread uh and then we let it cool off and then when, you cool, when it's cooled off we just slice it and cut it all up into 25 skinny pieces and then you take those pieces and put it back in the oven and burn it again so then then you eat it and then you digest it and you just completely everything uh, <laughs> we just treat this plant so bad it's uh, absolutely incredible but all the 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 uh, the changes that have to happen with bread of course uh uh just, just talking about the permanent irreversible changes of all of those steps that i just described to be able to make uh to be able to make bread is uh is hilarious it's, it's always one of my favorite examples uh this poor plant just doesn't stand a chance bread uh or wheat <laughs> but anyway uh uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, nem nan kwa. Of course, uh, the change that's happening here with the, describing this plant kwa, that change that's happening is that when you look at it, when you first look at it, it's it's like uh, just this beautiful little bud, and it looks like a an avon that's fully bloomed, and you're like, wow, what a beautiful plant! But then it just pops. Pow, and then and does this and you're like whoa look at this change that's happening and and what an incredible change and so we will acknowledge that that it looks like a flower that that has multiple different uh blooms and uh uh yeah it's 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 fun my favorite example uh to be able to show this uh this idea of uh change and queer uh <laughs> but uh yeah this one uh uh i don't know if it's on if it's on any campus in particular but i just love it so much and i just found some really really nice pictures of it so i wanted to share those <laughs> uh yeah the um uh we use these roots we use the roots we make tea with them i wonder if i ever made it for students uh, cause usually like when we're working at Fleming, uh, we will, uh, yeah, we'll make, um, we'll make tea for them. This one is really, really good tea. It kind of tastes like cloves. Uh, w one of the really cool things about, uh, 
uh, about what I do, teaching about medicine, teaching about plants, is that, uh, yeah, it's not always about medicine. It's uh, a lot of the times I get to bust in to be able to teach about cuisine, about how we have all these different tastes and flavors. Uh, because the way everybody will look at Nishlaba cuisine, uh, the way that uh, First Nation people used to eat, uh, or used to live everything is all just brown everything is brown our clothes are buckskin brown our houses are bark brown everything is brown our 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 plate with our food is like uh, is like dry deer meat brown with a little bit of berries mixed in or something like that and um one of my favorite ideas is that this is not this is not the way that it was. Oh, it bothers me. Our cuisine, the way that my grandma describes it is that when she was cooking with her with her mom uh, or watching her mom cook, the, the when they would eat, it was like an experience. It was it was really intense. It was really, really cool. It was really, really good. And uh, um, and it. It was extremely colorful. She would describe it as being very vibrant. Uh, of course, by the time uh, my grandmother was being was being raised, was uh, there was a lot of gardening incorporated into our uh, into their lifestyle. So they had so they did a lot of gardening, which uh, was not a big part of Nishnaba life. We were, uh, our lifestyle rejected uh, uh, gardening, for the most part, uh, rejected any ideas of permanence, uh, which gardening is. There was a lot of trade that happened between uh, Chibuik and other communities that, that were harvesting or, or were gardening. Uh, so there was that engagement there. But for the most part, we were a community that was just in the bush. And so um, I, I want to speak from that perspective and from uh, and from the ability of that cuisine was is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and so like one of my favorite things is to be able to show people, you know, we have we have citrus trees. We have the most northern species of citrus trees Anthoxylum americanus is uh, prickly ash northern prickly ash we'll call it gawkamish but it's a citrus tree those leaves smell like limes they could use them in your cooking like the zest of a lime the fruit that that plant will create is like uh, is like a citrus peel and it and it tastes like oranges uh, and and um, and it's also this Xanthoxylum is the same species or the same family uh, that um, is that Szechuan peppers are and so we have like Nishnaba Szechuan peppers that sort of uh, um, that when you use a little bit in your cooking uh, they will increase the amount of saliva that you have you'll salivate like crazy if you ever just pop a couple Szechuan peppers in your mouth they make you salivate and uh, saliva is one of the only reasons how you can taste if you have no saliva you have no ability to taste if you have more saliva you have more ability to taste and so if you, if you using a little bit of this uh, prickly ash uh, galkamish xanthoxylum americanus in your cooking then you're uh, just leveling up your ability to taste that food and so then we have like memnaanqua this uh, prairie smoke gm triflora we have uh, the roots of this being used in cuisine if you take a couple chunks of these roots and put them in a pan uh, and sort of uh, like if because we usually use them like when they're dry uh, I don't even think I've ever used them fresh when we are cooking but yeah if you cut up these uh, pieces of dry root and put it in a pan uh, and start to warm it up like to, to toast your uh, er, like spices before you cook uh, the smell that comes out of these is is just like cloves and so you get this really rich warm smell and so you know cloves are staple uh, ingredient in uh, in in making sure your rice is uh, fragrant or in uh, certain types of curries and then certainly baking and so we have that we have that here we have a really strong clove we have a really strong citrus we have ginger we have licorice or like anise and we have all these different tastes and all these different flavors uh that are responsible for creating all of these other like Indian cuisine. We have all of the staples necessary to create those flavors, uh, and then in certain Asian cuisine, certain tastes that, that 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 this cuisine will have. We have that potential here as well. And so when when my grandma is describing the way that her mom cooked, where it was like an experience, you know how we got this was because 
um, uh, when we would take my grandma out to eat uh, in restaurants, and, she, and those are the memories that she would have is like, this is how intense it used to be. Like we take her to an East Indian restaurant or like a Vietnamese restaurant. And the, and the way that she would eat there, she would say, this is, this is the way that it used to be when I would eat with my mom, sometimes with the meals that she would make using all these different medicines, they, she was able to make things that had this not exactly she's not saying like her mom made curry or something like this but the dishes that her mom made were so incredibly that had a that had a that had a really incredible depth of flavor and that was this whole experience just to have and it and it was like i didn't even know that this existed sort of thing and so i i you know i like to use uh prairie smoke as this example because like out of all of the different things that we have here like the ginger flavors the cinnamon flavors the the uh uh, uh, licorice flavors, you know, it's like, of course we would have these, uh, but to have like a really earthy, deep clove taste, that's always really unusual. Sort of throws people for a loop and they're like, whoa, this is from here. <laughs> this is Memnonqua. How the heck can it taste this good? And so I really like to use this as an example to be able to show that, yeah, man, we have some really incredible tastes and flavors uh, that that deserve to be explored. Um, but yeah, let's see how you guys have. Oh, no questions. Yeah, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> what did I do? Two plants? Okay, I don't want to... I don't want to... Uh, how, how late did I start again? Maybe I could squeeze another one in there. Uh, yeah, maybe I could do this one. So... Hopefully that was uh, smooth enough of a... Yeah, I'll do one more. Just because I can't help it. But uh, this one is a, uh, this is a really incredible one too. Uh, sage wart, or some people will call it um, uh, field, like mugwort or something like that. Artemisae. Uh, um, actually, which one is this? Artemisae field sage wart, prairie sage wart. Uh, I can't remember the Latin name now. I don't want to mess it up anyway. Uh, but yeah. This is the, it's really common anyway. Like you get to the shorelines of any Great Lakes uh, and it'll probably be there popping out of rocks or little sandy outcroppings like right there. You know, it'll, 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 it'll be pretty uh, present. Wait, this is not even showing. Okay. Let me figure this out. <laughs> so you could see, okay, my window capture. Sage wart. All oh, right, now. Photos. Now I'm going to have to go like this. Nah. Okay, I want you guys to see these photos. How, how come this is... Okay. <laughs> ah, poopy pants. Why is this happening? Okay, window capture on. There you are. Okay, cool. Got it. I think it's time. I think I just got to be more patient. Yeah, so you'll see it in like sandy places like that. You'll see it in uh, little, yeah, little sandy outcroppings all around the Great Lakes. It's a very common plant. Uh, so we will call it Mosejivik. And so some of you guys, the, when, whenever I hear, whenever you hear uh somebody speaking Jibwe or somebody speaking Shalom when I, I I really want you guys to be able to just listen to the sounds and uh um uh, like uh like Jibik is a root Jibkan is a root uh so Mosejivik you have to understand who Mose is and so Mos is uh is a uh, moose like the big moose with the big ears and the long skinny legs and the big floppy nose, that's moose. Uh, and the reason why we call him that is because 
He's like a, the ultimate defoliator <laughs> with his big lips going onto branches and then just sucking them all off. And so he, he defoliates all of the trees, uh, eats twigs all the time. And, uh, you know, their role, they have a really amazing sort of ecological role that they play in because of that action. So if you were to like personify the world, to look at the world as having organs like all of the organs you do all the systems you do and processes that your body has and grows goes through uh the way where we would look to the to the, being the lungs of the earth a lot of people will say oh probably the rainforest because of all of the you know because green equals oxygen right because green plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen so the more green the more oxygen and Rainforests are always green, but actually like the structure, the ecology of a rainforest actually consumes the almost the same amount of oxygen that it produces. And so they end up being very neutral places. Uh, the, if, but if we were to personify the world and look to the, a place in the world that had the mo that created the most amount of oxygen, it would be the boreal forest of Canada. Uh, it would be like Nishnavek. This is the lungs of the earth responsible for making the most amount of oxygen for the rest of the planet. And so, uh, of course, what ha so if you take a step back from that, from, from the situation and look at a, uh, just look at a fruit tree, uh, what happens when you prune a fruit tree, when you, when you cut it and you tease it a little bit, uh, what happens is the foliage can sometimes even almost double. Uh, and then the, the amount of reproduction, uh, reproductive mechanisms the next year are, are, will, will be way more. And so there will be way more fruit. And so you do with fruit trees to increase your yield of fruit. Uh, but in the wild, when you prune a tree and it makes twice as many leaves, that's twice as much oxygen. And then there, and then if it's making more fruit, then that's more fruit to be able to plant more trees. That's going to make more. <laughs> and so moose, their role, uh, what that word moose is describing is their ability to prune all of the trees that are in the boreal forest uh, and so they prune it and are making more leaves are and so those more leaves are making more oxygen so you take the lungs of the earth moose are responsible for maintaining that that status and so moose are lar play a large role in creating the oxygen for the this entire planet that's how important moose are because of that action that they have moose to be able to be twig eaters uh and so moose says a small moose is actually a caterpillar. <laughs> a moose is, is a caterpillar uh, because they share that same action to be able to defoliate, to be able to uh, be that stressor, to be able to instigate the trees that that tree's response in in its reproduction, in its in that whole uh, to catalyze that whole process and to increase the 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 health of the lungs and the capacity of the lungs of the earth. And so moose, the little moose, uh, is uh, that's a really fun thing to understand. And this plant is moose uh, and so this is a caterpillar root. And uh, uh, for this, I don't really understand the role that caterpillars play in the root specifically of this plant. Of course, I'm reaching out to as many experts as I can. Um, to be able to understand if there's anything specific that caterpillars, uh, maybe a particular species of caterpillars has on this plant. So far yet, I haven't really found that out. So, you know, if you know anybody, I figure I better talk about this one today. So in case anybody from Fleming is listening, help me. <laughs> but uh, uh, the... Um, this plant, I, I do know that like it's a it's a it's a host plant to I don't know how many species of caterpillars and butterflies like thirty something thirty two or thirty six, uh, so like lots of caterpillars and uh, will will uh, host on this plant butterflies hosting moths hosting with using this plant as like a home home base, um, I don't think it's like the 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 most successful host I don't know so somebody help me. So I'm not just coming on here to teach. I'm coming on here to ask questions. <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe we could just end it there. Talked about a lot of cool things uh, 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 this time. But yeah, um, I really like this. Hanging out a little bit. Just like that. And uh, yeah, that's fun. Thank you guys. Coming to hang out. 
I mean, make sure you have no questions. No questions. Cool beans. Uh, we'll uh, see you on s not Saturday. Friday. Next Friday. That was fun. See? I'm getting the hang of this. I like this. We'll see you on Friday, folks. Fleming folks. Ta-ta.